faithful. Amen. Praise the Lord. We had a relapse after Saturday. I confess that be here. So if you turn to 1 Corinthians 13, I may get shot a little later, but it's all I've got right now. If you can't act your faith, there's no point in teaching it. If you notice from your outline, this is the gifts and love. The gifts and love. Notice the and is important because the non-charismatic church always tells us it's the gifts versus love. Either are. You know, love is more important. You know the argument if you ever talk to a non-charismatic. It's either are. But we've entitled this the gifts and love. Because the stress in this whole section, 12, 13, and 14, is one. Not love, but the gifts. He's teaching on the gifts. One theme. And he didn't write in chapters. And so he interjects between 12 and 14 the necessity of ministering the gifts in love. Or it would profit us nothing. You see the whole section as we showed you last time. 1231, covet earnestly the best gifts. He's talking about the gifts. 14.1, desire spiritual gifts. Then he closes chapter 14, speaking of two gifts, forbid not speaking in tongues in the church and covet to prophesy. So it's a case again of the church of our day throwing the baby out with the bathwater because a sincere study of this section will show you that in chapter 12, he's teaching on the diversities of the gifts and how they must operate in cooperation with one another. In chapter 13, he says the gifts are to operate in love because you're going to operate a gift out of love, like speak out in prophecy while someone is maybe speaking in tongues because your gift on the basis of chapter 14 you believe is more important. So you can minister your gift but not in love. And then chapter 14, he's still talking about the gifts, except here he's dealing with the utterance gifts, the three utterance gifts. Prophecy, tongues, and interpretation. So we've got one subject. If one would just sit down and read 12 through 14, you'd see there's one subject, the gifts of the Spirit. And yet the non-charismatic church lifts chapter 13 totally out of his context. And he didn't write in chapters. He's still talking about gifts in 13. He talks about little else. Love and the gifts, how to minister the gifts. Many of them, if not all of them, mentioned there. Not all, but many of them. And so they lift chapter 13 out of his context and tell us that love is more important than the gifts. Are the fruits of the Spirit are more important than the gifts of the Spirit? And generally they tell you that with pretty much of a contemptuous, unloving spirit and attitude, which always amazes me if they're going to believe that, why they don't demonstrate what they're preaching. And I've never really run into a case where they do. I remember several years ago in speaking in Goshen College, they invited me, you know, and they should know what they're asking for. 
they invited me to speak on the charismatic outpouring. And I did. I told them the whole thing, gave my testimony, really. And then they had a question and answer period after, which I never endorsed, but they had it, so I went along with it. And had two or three, at least, students who were quite upset that God was alive and still working <laughs> miracles and that you could pray the prayer of faith. And one stood up and objected to that, that that would be presumption. And that was before the faith and presumption doctrine became popularized. But he said, to follow literally, Mark 11:24 is presumption. It's really pathetic where the church is today. Of course, you know that's a religious campus. And then one stopped me before I got out the door. And I mean, he really let me have it that the fruits of the Spirit were far more important than the gifts. The gifts were relatively unimportant, especially tongues. And I mean, he let me have his message in such an unkind, unloving spirit that he was actually denying the message he was trying to preach. Which shows you what spirit's operating, because if it was the Holy Spirit, he would have ministered to me in love. Especially, I, I guess at that time, 50-year-old being corrected by a 20-year-old. I mean, just common courtesy. Amen. Now, the deeper meaning or the purpose of Paul in chapter 13, what he's trying to show us here in what we call chapter 13, is that there is a direct relationship between spiritual maturity and the fruit of the Spirit. But there is no such necessary relationship between spiritual maturity and the gifts of the Spirit. In other words, you can have some gifts in operation and not be spiritually mature, is what we're saying. For example, if you note chapter 1, verse 7, with chapter 3, verse 1, he says in 1.7, you come behind in no gift. In other words, they had them all in operation. But then notice what he says in chapter 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual Christians, but as carnal Christians, even as unto babes in Christ. Now he said they had all the gifts in operation, but he said they were yet babies. 1 7 with 3 1. So, spiritual maturity will make a difference in how we use the gifts. We will minister them always in love and not consider one gift more important than the other. But the possession of the gifts doesn't depend upon spiritual maturity, as this church at Corinth shows. Now, do you understand that? that just because someone out there has a great gift of prophecy or word of knowledge or ministry of healing doesn't mean that person's mature at all. We'll say more about that later, but that's what Paul is saying. And I'm sure that some of you, I guess we all have along the way, raised the question, why sister so-and-so had such a tremendous gift a brother so-and-so was being used so mightily, it seemed. And yet, they weren't, you know, what you would call spiritual giants. And here's little old meek and quiet brother and sister Jones over here in the corner. You hardly ever hear anything out of them. But if you had to pick out anybody in the church as being spiritually mature, you'd point to them. And so you raise the question, now why would he give, just to make a point, old loudmouth, a gift of prophecy. You know, it's a person who just talks all the time. You can't get a word in edgewise. Why does he have the gift of prophecy? And they seem to have so little. I mean, you have to kind of search to see what they do have. We know they have it because he says in chapter 12 that every one of us have a spiritual manifestation. Well, to save you from asking God a question that he's already answered, why? And to save you from envy or jealousy or even self-pity because you thought you were a little more mature than the one who now seems to have tremendous gift of word of knowledge, anointing, or healing flowing through their life. To save you from envy or jealousy or self-pity, 
God's already answered that question, why? In chapter 12, verse 11 and verse 18. All these worketh that one and selfsame spirit who divides to every man individually as he wills. King James severally is individually. He divides individually as he wills. It's not our will. Then verse 18, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the church. And I like that phrase, as it pleased him. Oh, praise God. They're better orators than I am. Better in a lot of things, if you really wanted to know what I believe about it. But this is the way it is. He chooses the weak, and I don't mean physically weak. Trials are a blessing, remember? Amen. Hallelujah. Trials are a blessing because when you come through them, it's like James says, you're more mature. Plus, God works things in you along the way. You have to take the whole Bible. You see some things you didn't think too important or didn't deal with. You know the story. That is, you're his child. So I'm glad it's that way. The Holy Spirit gives us gifts as it pleases him, and God puts us in the body to function as it pleases him. If it's a quiet intercessor that you don't even know, some of you don't even know we have intercessors in the body. You don't know who they are. Well, you see, their gift isn't paraded like the Lord shows me somebody in here has a crooked left foot. You see, that's more spectacular than the crooked left foot raises up and says it just straightened out. God said every member is necessary, and there are less gifts than intercessors that we could mention you know, in the body. So we have no more control over the gifts, you know, which we receive than we do over the size of our bodies, our color of our eyes, or, well, even the hair, straight, curly, whatever. You don't have any control over the way God made you. He made your physical body the way it pleased him. Now, we're not getting into the fact that Satan sometimes moves in and deforms and so forth, but God doesn't do that. God never made a cripple. So if he made your physical body the way it pleased him, there's nothing you can do about it. Some people get a facelift, I know. Fake tan, have their hair curled. grow new fingernails that sometimes fall off, <laughs> look like pinto bean shells. <laughs> Anybody have to hide their hands tonight? That's what they remind you of. Not really claws, but you know what a pinto bean shell looks like? They're all curved over and about this. Well, anyway, they try to recreate. Well, you say, what of the admonition? You just quoted it three times to seek those gifts and desire spiritual gifts. Aren't we supposed to seek certain gifts? Well, we know he says that, but you notice he also said what is said in verses 11 and 18, that God gives the gifts as it pleases him. Paul didn't say desire a certain gift. He said desire to be used through the gifts in love. Of course, there's some people who never even bother to find out what their gift is. It's just sit and enjoy the service. Well, that's not a gift. <laughs> that's a blessing. Let me hasten to add, that doesn't mean next Sunday to jump up and start prophesying. But seek the gifts and whatever it may be. You know, over in Romans 12, there are gifts of giving, gifts of mercy, gifts of exhortation. I still say some of the prophecies I hear are exhortations. And if people were taking seriously my exhortation about the gift of exhortation, they would not add to it, thus saith the Lord. But people do not always take you seriously. And that makes you responsible for everything you said, the Lord said it through you. That's a heavy responsibility. Thus saith the Lord is something we'll be judged for. That includes myself. 
In other words, I don't hear the anointing of the spirit of prophecy coming through them, but I hear exhortation. I know what it is. And I'm blessed by the exhortation. That's not my point. But why do we have to glorify a gift we don't have? There's nothing wrong with the gift of exhortation. Now let me give you a couple of reasons why God divides the gifts as he wills and not according to our will. Well, first of all, you may be seeking a gift he already has enough of in the body of Christ. You know, the local body. And we'd end up with three eyes, four ears, two tongues, and so on. You see, God doesn't need an overbalance of gifts. And then another reason is that you may not minister the gift as effectively as Brother Jones or Sister Smith over here. Now, you think you would. I'm sure you do. But I dare say some never think that that isn't the gift God wants them to have because they wouldn't be sufficient in it. And back to the point of exhortation versus prophecy that we've mentioned several times in this church. And I still hear exhortations that are, thus saith the Lord. You never should add that to an exhortation. An exhortation is like when I'm teaching you, the Lord has given me this and I'm putting it in my words. But when it's thus saith the Lord, that'll come to pass just that way, and it's absolutely infallible. That's as much as Scripture, if it's really thus saith the Lord. I know of one former prophet that was very hesitant, he said, to use that. But he said when he did use it, it came to pass. And you would expect that out of a prophet. And so you're wanting to be a prophet and you try to force it with thus saith the Lord, but you're an exhorter or occasionally anointed to exhort. So you're not going to function efficiently in prophecy if it's exhortation. I really mean it, friends. I can hear exhortation time and again. I don't mean all the time. That comes forth as prophecy and it is not Prophecy, as far as I'm concerned, and being pastor, I've got everything to gain, and so do you, and nothing to lose by taking seriously these exhortations. See, if I said, thus saith the Lord, brother so-and-so has the gift of exhortation, but he's trying to prophesy, you see, then that would be infallible if it's from the Lord. But I'm exhorting you because I don't have the final say. Maybe you're a beginning prophet son of a prophet, like in the Old Testament. So I have to leave leeway that you'll develop into a prophet or prophetess. But I'm saying I don't hear prophecy sometimes, I hear exhortation. I would think that'd be all you'd have to say about it. Over the years we've said it many times. So it's to be helpful to the body. You may not function as well in one gift that you really desire as you would in another. Why do we have to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord? I've actually heard it tacked on the end, you know, because, well, I've said it now, and it's almost a little pause, thus saith the Lord. And there's no anointing of prophecy on it. But you don't really need a heavy anointing to exhort somebody. You can talk quietly. We have also said over the years, that if you are impressed, the Lord wants you to have a certain gift or ministry, press in by faith. Be it unto thee according to thy faith. I don't mean act your faith before you have the gift, but press in. See, that's between you and the Lord. Because I do believe he does impress upon some of us at least that he has a certain gift and ministry for us, or more out there. I believe he has more for me. I'm patient. I believe there's a time when it will come forth. And it just isn't my idea. Others have said it. And so on. And I don't mind telling you what it is. But I believe the Lord does, so I won't. <laughs> for years I have claimed and confess, not reclaiming, but reaffirming my claim and renewing my confession. 
that I believe, Lord, you have this gift and ministry for me, and that it will open when the fulfilling of some of those many visions come to pass. And by the way, how could you die but live if you've got all those wonderful works of the Lord yet to declare? So you've always got that in the back of your mind when the enemy's trying to incapacitate you. But having said that, you can't be careless and take for granted, oh, well, I've got a ministry out there and I'll just see this thing through. And No, you've got to walk close to the Lord. You've got to intercede. You've got to take corrective action if it's necessary in your life and all that. I mean, God can substitute somebody else for you or for me if we don't toe the line. So it doesn't work automatically. Hallelujah. Well, with that as a background, chapter 13, I like to think of as a picture of ideal Christian love. It sets forth the nature of ideal Christian love. The very essence of the ideal of what Christian love would be is here. If there was no other passage inspired that Paul wrote, this is. Of course, you know, that's a figure to make a point. This is the most inspiring passage in all of his epistles. It can be called a New Testament psalm of love. Now in chapter 12, Paul has said, that we all don't have the same gifts of the Spirit. He says he divides, you know, to one this and another that. And then he asks in the close of the chapter, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all have the gifts of healing and so forth? We don't. He said we don't all have the same gifts of the Spirit, but he says we all can have the same fruits of the Spirit especially love. Nothing to keep you from having all of the fruits of the Spirit of Galatians 5. Now, the first three verses all I'm going to deal with tonight, and I've entitled this section of verses 1 to 3, I'll be dealing with the rest of the verses in another study. I've entitled it, The Necessity of Love, Not the Benefits of so much, but the absolute necessity of love on our part. Now, to show the absolute necessity of love in all that we do or experience, he contrasts love with two things, what we possess and what we do, in verses 1 to 3. What we possess. He said you can possess all of the gifts of the Spirit. Verses 1 and 2. And then in verse 3, he says that we can do great works of philanthropy, giving our goods to the poor, or even the supreme sacrifice, be martyred. But without love, it's just empty, outward works that may impress men at times. You know, you give money away, that impresses men. If you die at the stake, that'll impress most people. But it doesn't impress God. Let's read those verses. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling symbol, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. You can have all the gifts, but you're nothing without love. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Now that's pretty solemn and sobering. It's about as hard to give all your money away as it is to give your life away. But he says you can do all of that. Or you can 
have tremendous gifts of the Spirit so that the whole world stands in awe. But if you can't love your brother, sister, it profits you nothing. It's just all outward works, emptiness, impressing men, but it doesn't impress God. Sometimes they help men this way, certainly. To give a beggar a thousand dollars helps him, but doesn't help you. If you gave it out of the wrong motive, so you could deduct it from your income tax, which is amusing, a little aside, send in your gifts and offerings and we'll send you a tax deductible receipt. You get that all the time in the mail and over the radio. Now, let me add a word in view of all we've covered thus far about you're not spiritually mature because you have the gifts, you're spiritually mature because you have the fruits. And we've said that you can have gifts and not be real mature. But let me add a word of caution. Paul does not mean that a person who does not manifest the fruit of the Spirit, especially love, is not in any permanent sense going to be used in a great anointed ministry, have an outstanding manifestation of some of the supernatural gifts. But in this early period of the church, and this is the beginning of all things, you see, the church of Corinth is set forth for our instruction as an example of how, for a while at least, you can have all the gifts of the Spirit in operation as they did and not be ministering them in love. Everybody all over the place trying to prophesy and talk in tongues and so forth, not concerned about the other person. They were just getting blessed. That would be one way he deals with that in chapter 14. How you can have all the gifts, not minister them in love. And remember, much of this epistle deals with the divisions in the body. So there's no love when there are constant divisions. So you could have the gifts operating without love. The body could be divided. But you see, it's going to profit them nothing. To use one example, verse 1, tongues is a good example. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, which is just empty noise. I looked around for a cymbal. I was going to give a little demonstration of that. Just bang on it with a stick. Does that edify you? I don't want to break the light. But that's all people get out of you. If you're speaking in tongues of men and angels and have not love, you're just like a noise, empty noise. Doesn't mean a thing. In other words, the net effect upon your speaking in tongues to us on Sunday, Wednesday, whenever, and then you're speaking with hate and jealousy and wrath, criticism, gossip on Monday, the net effect upon the church is you're just a noise. Now, if they know that's going on, that's all we hear. We don't hear the Lord speaking to us through your tongues. It's just a tinkling cymbal. Just bang on the cymbal. And while it may get your attention for a moment, after a while, you wish they'd shut up. And it's not effect upon heaven. It has absolutely no effect. It profits you nothing. You're wasting your time. We might note in passing, what did he mean here about tongues of angels? Languages of angels. Are some of the languages we speak the languages of angels? What are angelic tongues or languages? Well, again, if you really want to know, no opinions of men. You'll have to wait and ask Paul. Because... I don't know. I've never heard the various modes of communication of angels. Because if they speak to you, they speak to you in English. If you're Italian, you'll hear Italian. If a man speaks seven or eight languages, even some of them poorly, he's considered a linguistic scholar. 
if you could speak all of those and whatever modes of communication angels can use and have not love, you're still nothing. But I do know what he meant as far as we need to know what he meant. That he is covering all of the possible forms of language. Human as well as that of spirit beings. And if you spoke all of those without love in your life, it would profit you nothing. Now, angels in the Bible, of course, are said to be superior to men, more powerful, greater in wisdom and might. So their modes of communication would be far above or advanced over the human race. Human race only spoke one language until they got to trying to defy God and build a tower up to heaven. And so your human languages are a result of sin and rebellion. And angels can speak without opening their mouth, communicate by thought transfer and so forth. So all he's saying is that whatever mode, you can have all the modes, human as well as supernatural, Without love, it profits you nothing. Verse 2, he says, Moreover, possessing the gift of prophecy, understanding mysteries, which is doubtless a reference to the word of wisdom, since it is a revelation of the mystery or hidden plans of God. That's what word of wisdom is. He's talking about the gifts, remember. If you have all knowledge, he's talking, no doubt, about the word of knowledge. Because he's listing gifts. Next is faith. I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. And I think he's addressing that. He didn't know he was, but for our benefit, at least, faith assembly. That we can have all the faith in the world. And we've got faith here. And all to God's glory, it's being demonstrated tonight. All to his glory, but... The verdict is, without love, without love, we are nothing. Now, without question, and we don't minimize it here, one of the greatest blessings you can have is to have your heart filled with faith. Hebrews 11:6. without faith, it's impossible to please God. You can have love. Without faith, you're not going to please Him. That's why you should never contrast fruits with gifts and faith with love and all that. As far as negating one. But you can have your heart filled with faith, but without love in your heart, then even your faith won't please God. It takes faith to please Him, but it has to be biblical love along with it. That is ministered in love. Your life has to manifest love. Galatians 5, 6 tells us that. Faith works by love. Faith works, but faith works by love. Faith worketh by love. Now you ought to mark that down and remember it. That's the whole message in a nutshell. Now we need to keep in mind what we've taught before, that true love is not mere sentimentalism, which so many use as an excuse to substitute sentimentalism for biblical love and thus they don't have to obey God. In other words, if I substitute love, I don't have to obey his injunction to teach sound doctrine, to discipline an erring member or spank my child. You know, this is the way they present it. And that isn't biblical love to disobey some other passage in the Word of God. That's humanism. That's sentimentalism. So they will excuse error, heresy, disobedience, divisiveness, and say, now, if I don't judge that or discipline that or correct that, I'm manifesting love. That isn't love. That's sentimentalism. They say even to discipline your child, you don't love him. That is spanking. That's what they mean. To discipline your child is a lack of love. 
On the contrary, we're told in Proverbs, he that spareth the rod hates his son, but he that loves him will correct him. Now that's God's word. Now how can you dare to substitute human sentimentalism for that definition of biblical love, which corrects? Love corrects. And correction is done in love. You know, it's not one or the other. But those who withhold teaching the truth and discipline or correction or admonition, and those who chide us and say to those who refuse to compromise God's word and obey like Jude 3, contend earnestly for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, call them religious bigots, and those who obey the word and discipline a member or their child, lacking in love, one day they're going to be revealed for what they really are. Human sentimentalists who prove by their actions they love men more than they love God. You see, when you don't obey God, even if it is a matter of correction or preaching a strong word and showing people the true way is the hard way, but it's required. Just, you know, they don't want the feedback from people and they don't want to hurt their feelings or whatever. Or they want to keep their meal ticket in the church. They know the church will put them out if they really get to preaching the word. People who do that don't love God. They love men more than God. Doesn't matter how long they've been in the church. But remember over in chapter 5, the church was rebuked for not correcting, disciplining that sinning member, a fornicator. And then I'm reminded you don't have to turn there. At 1 Samuel chapters 1, 2, and 3, old Eli, the high priest who did not discipline his sons, in the second chapter, verse 22, now Eli was very old. And he heard all that his sons did unto Israel. So he was not unaware of it. What were they doing? As you read those chapters, you see they were stealing the sacrifices, which was illegal and a sin. And they were priests. His sons were priests. They were committing fornication with the women who came to the temple. I've never figured out why they allowed it, but the point is they did. I guess it shows that women could sin then just as much as men. God's judgment upon Eli was he suffered a violent death, died by a broken neck, and his line in the priesthood was removed forever from the priesthood. It died out right there. So I always remember old Eli when somebody tells me, well, that's a lack of love to discipline somebody in the church because they fornicated or lied or whatever. I'll tell you, I've got a greater fear of God than the criticism of people for doing what God says. And thus, while faith without love is as displeasing to God as love without faith, both are displeasing. Faith without love is as displeasing as love without faith. Once we come to that truth, we must make sure the love we have is pleasing to God. And that we don't do what we've been talking about, substitute human emotion and sentimentalism, which fails to correct error or teach all the truth, and so on, and then call that love. Well, I love my brother too much to tell him he needs to correct something. And such people will find out too late that what they call love was nothing but sentimentalism. You see, in the final analysis, any substitute for scriptural love is as much an abomination to God as a professing Christian who shows a lack of love because the substitute love is a lack of love too. See, to substitute sentimentalism 
and human emotion and shedding a lot of tears and hugging your brother's neck and saying, we understand that you get drunk three times a year, but it's just a bad habit. I believe the Lord forgives every time you repent and then go do it again. You know, that doesn't help him. I heard a minister on the radio some time ago say that, that that's what they did with a certain man who professed to be a Christian. You see, substituting human emotion, sentimentalism, for true love is as much an abomination to God as a lack of love in those who are true Christians. Because the person who substitutes sentimentalism lacks love also. He's charging us if we correct a situation or preach the pure word without apology, saying that's a lack of love. He's charging us with lacking what he himself likes. You can't substitute anything for the biblical love of God that he requires of us and then charge somebody else with having a lack of love. Have you ever heard, I know you have, that love is more important than doctrine? We hear that all the time. Let's all get together in a Jesus 82 and leave your doctrine at home. If you love the Lord, you're my brother. And on and on and on. And they tell us that love is more important than doctrine. Well, doctrine is truth. Biblical doctrine is truth. So if you ask me, is love more important than truth? My answer is no. No way that love can be more important than truth. Look at verse 6. Love rejoices in the truth. And we hear all the time that love is more important than truth. Well, you're supposed to love your brother and not force your doctrine on him, is the expression. Well, here I'm told love rejoices in truth and does not rejoice in iniquity, which is always untruth and the opposite of truth. How much plainer could it be? Now, to be sure, love is the highest of the virtues. We're told in the conclusion of this chapter that there's faith, hope, love, and these three abide, and the greatest is love. No question, love is the highest of the virtues. But love is not higher than truth. That's a contradiction. That's making God contradict himself. And you've got to pin that down. Well, really, it isn't biblical love if it's not giving the truth to begin with. But to answer the argument that we always hear is verse 6. Love rejoices in truth, and it hates anything that is untruth or sin. Then verse 3, here he gives the supreme examples of philanthropy and self-sacrifice. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and give my body to be burned, and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. Wouldn't that be an awful experience to go through the agony of death at the stake? Some Christians have been tortured and sawn asunder, put in a hollow log and sawed through. But there was no love in your life, so one moment after death, you discovered it profited you nothing to die for what you said was the gospel. Well, he says here, first of all, though, we can give all of our possessions away. And yet you can do that out of a sense of duty our sense of fear, not out of love. You can give all your possessions away out of a sense of duty in the sense that you remember what Jesus said to the rich young ruler, that the thing he lacked was his goods were standing in the way of the kingdom. And so because you fear that, you don't want to miss the kingdom, you can give all your goods to the poor, but you don't really have any love for the poor. In fact, you don't want to be around them. You more or less despise them. They're shabby and 
sometimes didn't have enough soap to keep clean. But you're concerned about obeying God and missing hell, getting in the kingdom. Now that has happened. That isn't love. Or out of a sense of fear, they remember what he went on to say in that passage where he said, it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye. People try to make all things out of that, but they had needles back then. I don't want to get into the theories, but it'd be easier to go through the eye of a needle, a camel, with the humps and all, than a rich man to enter heaven. And so you remember that. And you can give all your goods away. It hasn't been too long ago to a man heard a message on you don't want to be caught with your possessions when Jesus comes and he's about to return. And not just here, but he started pouring money out in various places. But we discovered he had a control spirit. And he'd always blow a trumpet before him. Announcing, you know, what he's doing for the Lord. I don't know how many times he said to me, I don't want to get caught sitting on this money when the Lord comes. See, there was not love there. It was to control. And you can control with money even though people say, well, he won't control me. Well, we won't get into that. There's ways you can be controlled. Like one brother told me, he bought him a car before he knew he was giving all this money up here. And he said, when this discovery came up here, the fact that he told me bold lies and whatever. He said, well, he came to me wanting me, in effect, to help him with the problem in the church down there, whether or not they should take an airplane and all of that, which he told him, if you do, well, I'm out of the church, now that he discovered what he was up to. But I said, see, that's my point. He came to you because you had taken a car from him in innocency to speak on his behalf concerning the matter in another church. That's my point. Well, what are you going to say to a guy who just bought you a car? Well, I'm sorry. I can't put in a good word for you that you're an okay Joe and all of that. You get bound, especially when you sign for it. Even in his own mind, if he was trying to do it, not to be caught sitting on his money when the Lord returns, and that's not the motive. I've already given you other motives. But even then, it's out of fear. Not really love. If you've got a real concern for that brother, you can slip it in the offering box with his name on it. We'll see it gets to him. It's happened before. Put John Doe on there, if there's a John Doe. We don't need it or want it. We won't even open it. That's anonymous. And if you've got a distinctive style of handwriting, write with your left hand. <laughs> if you're really not letting your right hand know what your left hand does, that's a way you can put that into practice. I think the Bible's plain enough on that. You're not to blow a trumpet before you. But my point is you can give away your money out of fear. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Now that's something to consider. Here's another thing. One may offer the supreme self-sacrifice. Burned at the stake for his beliefs. And you know, I'm sure people have. You can do that without any love for Jesus because you love your doctrine and you won't recant You'd die before you took back one thing that you believe is truth. But it's not Jesus. I have such a love for you, I count it a privilege to do as thousands of martyrs have done. And they say, if I don't deny you, deny my faith, they will take my life. It's not so much that but that they fear hell if they take back some doctrine. And often it's just an old dead creed or denominational doctrine that people are thinking they're defending. They'll go to prison or jail and they're defending some old man's doctrine. It's not always the stake, but still prison is a pretty rough experience for your faith. And that happens all over the world. And they'll defend things that are not defensible from the Word of God. 
Or maybe they really think they love Jesus. They're doing this for Jesus. You know, that's possible. I'm not judging their motives. They have such a stubborn determination to defend believers' baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They would go to prison. Some people would, rather than deny what they believe is truth. And of course, we don't have to digress there. I don't suppose anybody out on a night like this except home folks. But in case there are, the only baptism practiced in the New Testament in early church history was in the name of Jesus. And there's a tape on that if you need to hear it. The apostles who received the commission of Matthew 28, 19 to baptize into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit went right out and started baptizing in the name of Jesus. They either knew, as Paul said, all the fullness of the Godhead resides in Jesus. And thus to baptize into his name is baptizing into the Godhead. You can't divide God up. Or they disobeyed him. So you have your choice because... Again and again, we're told they baptized in the name of Jesus. Not once in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So people will die for something that maybe sincerely they're defending or go to prison or lose their property. Sincerely defending a denominational doctrine or creed. That one just came to mind. There are many others. But with a lack of love, back to what he's talking about, whatever you do, it profits you nothing. Even the supreme self-sacrifice. story I read in early church history about a man being led on his way as a martyr to his death, being martyred for the Christian faith. And he had been at odds with a brother in the church. And the brother saw what was happening and rushed up to him and asked him before he went to his death to forgive him. He said, please forgive me. Because he knew if no forgiveness on this side, there's no forgiveness on that side. You know that's the word of God, or do I need to quote it? If you don't forgive your brother, God will not forgive you. He rushed up to him and said, will you forgive me? And he refused. And he had a few hours the most to live. He was on his way to his death. By his lack of love, he was denying the doctrine he was dying to defend. Amen. Without love, see, you can die, Paul says, for what you believe is a Christian faith. But if there's not love in your heart before you die, you're denying the very faith that you're dying to defend. Denying the faith you're dying to defend. I feel like I've met some people that's almost that stubborn. They would rather risk losing their salvation, you know, burning forever, not just a little while at the stake, than change their beliefs. Just absolutely refuse to consider what the Word of God says in view of their creed. And you just may be denying the faith and end up without anything. So in conclusion tonight, the apostle warns that it's possible to have the gifts. Let's say prophecy. The gift of prophecy, whereby truth flows through you, and yet, as it passes through your lips, it can pass through you without affecting you one iota. So you can have a gift like prophecy, have it flow through you and not change your life or affect you on iota. You've seen people like that. And then he says it's possible to give your possessions, even your life, and it would profit you nothing. Those who do not have love in this life, one moment after the death experience, they wake up to the realization they gave their life in vain. It didn't profit them anything. Friends, this is so important. We've got to see it's more than just having faith at Faith Assembly. 
It's more than just meeting all the requirements on our requirements list to be in fellowship. It's got to be love at home, love everywhere. Not just ministering the gifts in love, but ministering your life in love. Well, God is faithful. God is faithful. I confessed I would be here. The second trial was worse than the first. I just say that to His glory. Faith works, friends. Faith works. Hallelujah. God is faithful. God bless you. appreciate all your intercessions and love and phone calls. I can't talk too much about those things. I'm a little bit of a crybaby, so. <laughs> God bless you.